Let's look into hypothesis testing for equality of population variances. Here we're going to use the F test that requires the assumption of normally distributed populations. Now a warning right up front that these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated, so we should be pretty confident that our population is actually approximately normally distributed before using these procedures. Let's let S1 squared be the sample variance of N1 independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma1 squared. And similarly, S2 squared is going to be the sample variance of N2 independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma2 squared. And we are also going to assume that the samples are independent. We're going to need that for this F test to be reasonable. Suppose we wish to test the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal. We're going to choose the appropriate alternative hypothesis as one of these three possibilities. The correct one to choose depends on the nature of the problem as at hand as per usual in hypothesis testing. And we are going to use the test statistic F equals S1 squared over S2 squared, or in other words, the ratio of the sample variances. Now it turns out that if the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal is true, then this statistic here is going to have an F distribution. Now that F distribution has degrees of freedom for the numerator and degrees of freedom for the denominator. And we're going to have N1 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the denominator. To carry out our test, we're going to need a p-value. And suppose our alternative hypothesis is that sigma1 squared is greater than sigma2 squared, and this is our F statistic. If the null hypothesis is true, that F statistic has an F distribution. So I'm going to say F distribution with N1 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the denominator. So we might just say an F distribution with N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. This test statistic is eventually going to take on a value. Let's say it's here somewhere. So this is our F test statistic. Now, large values of this test statistic, which means that S1 squared is quite a bit larger than S2 squared, large values of this test statistic give us evidence against the null and in favor of this alternative. So our p-value is going to be the probability of getting the value we get in our sample or something even larger, or in other words, the area to the right of the test statistic. That is going to be our p-value for this alternative. And if our alternative is in the other direction, then we're going to use, well, a similar type of logic. Here's our F distribution again. That's our F distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. This F statistic is going to take on a value. So let's say this is our F test stat here. But in this case, the smaller the value of the F statistic, the greater the evidence against the null and in favor of this alternative. If F S1 squared is quite a bit less than S2 squared, then that's going to give some evidence against the null and in favor of this alternative. So our p-value is going to be the probability of getting this value that we get in our sample or something even less, or in other words, the area to the left. That is going to be our p-value for this alternative hypothesis. And if our alternative hypothesis is two-sided, then values of our test statistic far out in the right tail of the distribution, or far out in the left tail of the distribution, give us evidence against the null hypothesis. And so suppose that this F statistic takes on a value somewhere here. And again, I'm just going to call that my F test stat. Well, values way out in the right tail give us strong evidence against the null. Values way out in the left tail give us strong evidence against the null. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider this area to the right of the test statistic. And we're going to consider this area to the left of the test statistic. We're going to take the smaller of these two areas and double it. So our p-value is double the smaller area. And we've done that in other types of tests as well. Some sources suggest to always call the group with the larger sample variance group 1. What this does, if we consider our F test statistic, is the ratio of the sample variances here. If we're always calling the group with the larger sample variance group 1, then this S1 squared over S2 squared is always going to be over here somewhere in the right tail of the distribution. 
The only advantage this has is that areas in the right tail of the distribution are usually a little easier to find from a typical F table than areas in the left tail of the distribution. So it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things as long as you keep everything straight in your head, as long as you still follow that same p-value logic that I outlined above. But if we're using a table, it can sometimes be easier to do it this way. So you're going to have to consult with your professor or your textbook to see which way they want to go about it. Let's look at an example. Do 850 gram cereal boxes have greater variability in their weight than 475 gram boxes? Well, this 850 is what it says on the package, and 475 is what it says on the package. But there is some variability in the weight. So we might want to test the null hypothesis here that the variances are equal. And suppose this is our variance of our 850 gram boxes. What would we choose for an, an alternative hypothesis? Well, that depends, and it's debatable in different spots, but one thing we might consider here is that very often in the real world, variance tends to increase with the mean. The variability of elephant weights is certainly a lot more than the variability of field mouse weights. And in this spot, then, it might be reasonable to think that the variance is going to be greater in the 850 gram boxes than the 475 gram boxes. Or maybe there's no difference, but it's probably quite unlikely that the variance in the 475 gram boxes is actually greater. So depending on one's perspective on things, we might choose this alternative hypothesis that sigma 1 squared is greater than sigma 2 squared. Or in other words, the variance in the 850 gram serial boxes is greater than the variance in the 475 gram boxes. And suppose we feel it's reasonable in this setting to choose an alpha level of 0.05. We could choose a different value of alpha, but suppose we feel it's reasonable here to choose that one. Now here's some data I collected on my favorite type of breakfast cereal. I got some samples here of 850 gram boxes and 475 gram boxes. I got a sample of size 4 of 850 gram boxes, which is not a very large sample size at all. But I got 15 of these 475 gram boxes. And I went through and weighed this cereal in these different boxes, without the box, without the bag. But we got our sample variances here. And we might want to carry out that test we discussed above, testing the null hypothesis that the variances are equal. And against our alternative hypothesis, that the 850 gram boxes actually have a greater variance. And so we get our F statistic. And our F statistic is simply the ratio of the sample variances. And my S1 squared is the 40.917 over 16.714. And that equals to three decimal places, 2.448. Now the degrees of freedom for our f, the degrees of freedom in the numerator, are n1 minus 1, or in other words, 4 minus 1, or 3 degrees of freedom in the numerator. And in the denominator, 15 minus 1, or 14 degrees of freedom in the denominator. So if we draw out our f distribution here, and this is an f distribution, I'm going to call this f dist with... 3 and 14 degrees of freedom, well, this is my test statistic, and my test statistic is somewhere there, 2.448. And my alternative hypothesis is that sigma 1 squared is greater than sigma 2 squared. So my p-value is the probability of getting this value or something even greater, which is the area to the right of our observed test statistic here. And that is our p-value, and that's what we want to find. Now we can go to either a computer or a table to get that value. And if we went to a computer, so I'm going to give the exact value here. If we went to a computer, we would find that the p-value to three decimal places is 0 0.107. If we used a table, we're going to get a range of values. And if you use my table, we would get a range of values. And we'd see that the p-value is simply bigger than 0 0.10. It's better to use a computer if you have access to one and get the value using software. But this is our p-value. Now remember, up above, we had an alpha level of 0.05. This alpha level of 0.05. Our p-value is greater than the given alpha level. So the evidence against the null hypothesis is not significant at 0.05. Or in other words, we cannot reject 
the null hypothesis at a 5% significance level. Now this means that there is not significant evidence at alpha's 0.05 that 850 gram cereal boxes have greater variability than the 475 gram boxes. We do not have significant evidence of a difference in population variances. Let's take a look at a few warnings here or a few things to keep in mind. First of all, we had very small sample sizes. One of the groups had only four observations and the other one had 15 observations. Certainly four is a tiny sample size and 15 isn't all that large either. So with such small sample sizes, it would have been very difficult for our test to detect differences in the true variance unless those differences were very large. Or in other words, our test likely had very low power here with such low sample sizes. Another thing to keep in mind here is that we didn't truly have random samples from the populations of interest. I haphazardly selected a few boxes of each type from the store. Now there might not be any obvious biases there, but any time we don't have real random samples from the populations of interest, well, extrapolating out to those populations is a little bit dubious. And also, as I mentioned right off the top, this test does not work very well when that normality assumption is violated. And we didn't investigate that normality assumption. We should typically investigate that normality assumption using appropriate plots before carrying out tests like this.